All right, so welcome to Eat, Move, Think, the show about optimal wellness brought to you by MyCan. Wow. Oh, I was practicing. <laughs> okay, ready? <clears throat> Welcome, welcome, welcome to Eat Move Think, the show about optimal, optimal, optimal wellness brought, brought to you, you by Megan. Yeah, that, this is extremely good. Thank you. Oh my gosh. There's a lot of traffic. What can we hear? Oh, here. I definitely hear some car engines. I hear uh, a cart rattling somewhere. There was the noise that a truck makes when it backs up. Yeah, yeah, the beep, beep, beep. There's lots of bikes. This bike lane is pretty busy right now. There's Diesel. a lot of sounds happening out here. Cyclist yelling at another cyclist. Oh, yeah. So we are standing on a Toronto street corner. If you're living in a city and you work in a city, you know how annoying noise can be. Totally, yeah. But what we're talking about today is not just how annoying or distracting it is. What are the real health effects that come with living in the city and hearing these noises every day? And here comes the garbage truck. I'm Jasmine Ratch. I'm Chris Shulgin. We're the producers of Emu Think. And in today's episode, we're talking about noise and its effect on human health. That's right, Chris. So starting at just 35 decibels, your risk of dying from cardiovascular disease goes up by 2.9% for every 10 decibel increase in your exposure to road traffic noise. Okay, and just to put that in context, so essentially zero decibels is total quiet. Right. A ticking watch is about 20 decibels. Wow. The whisper or leaves rustling is about 30 decibels. The average sound of a room, a quiet room, is around 35, and then city traffic can be 85 decibels. So this is for sustained ongoing noise. Like if you live in the middle of the city and hear traffic outside your house every day, that can have a health risk. Totally. So today to learn about that, we have our host, Sean Francis, MedCan CEO and chair. He'll be talking to Dr. Tor Oyamo. He is an associate professor in the Department of Environmental Studies at Toronto Metropolitan University. And he's an expert on studying the connection between urban noise and its impact on our health. He'll be talking about the various effects that noises can have on our body, who is most at risk, and how you can know whether you're in safe sound limits or not. Amazing. All right, well, let's get to it. All right, here's Sean Francis in conversation with Dr. Tor Oyamo. Hi, it's Sean Francis, host of Eat, Move, Think podcast. I want to welcome our listeners to a really interesting session today with Dr. Tor Oyamo, who is a professor of geography and environmental studies at Toronto Metropolitan University on a topic which uh, most of us deal with, but never probably think about the health implications, which is noise, especially in urban settings. So really excited to have Dr. Ayamu on our session today. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. How did you get into this field of study? Because I'm guessing it's a bit of a narrow field. Yeah, it's a bit of a narrow field in certain areas. I came from a medical science background and then became more interested in how the environment affects health and uh, the project that uh, was the focus of my PhD was the Windsor highway and bridge expansion, if you're familiar with that, which is still ongoing, actually. But I also thought to myself, because I'm interested in sound and I guess noise by association, you know, that there's surely all these trucks going down this city street, basically, as it was at that time, must have an impact on on people too. So we kind of added noise to that project. And then that ball has kept rolling now for a number of years. And, and recently, really, that's all I've been, been looking at is environmental noise in the urban context with transportation sources being the most ubiquitous and harmful because they are so widespread and then that therefore being the main focus too. That's super interesting. What, can we just drill in then to your uh, PhD research? What did you discover? First of all, it's a bit of a cliche that it's still ongoing, of course. <laughs> Anyone uh, in an urban setting appreciates never-ending construction projects, but what did you discover with regard to this one specifically? 
as most research projects go, it didn't go completely to plan. We we had uh, hope to get a before and after study of, of people with similar mental health perceptions and general health and well-being in the area. But because I had to leave before the after was completed, it didn't go according to timeline. That didn't happen. So we ended up comparing a couple of different neighborhoods, basically normal residential neighborhood against the neighborhood where all the border traffic went and still goes. But now, of course, it's on to the new highway. And uh, basically found that the environmental perceptions of noise can be enhanced and, and worsened by air pollution and, and vice versa. Of course, noise is a subjective issue. So there's, I don't want to get into too much theoretical issues on this, but there is a certain element of how it affects your health and well-being associated with how much control you have, have over the source and, and what the source actually is. And what it means to you you know this is kind of you know well known in environmental health in general you know if you for example live next door to a factory that creates a lot of noise and air pollution you're more likely to accept that if you work there uh, and make money from it than uh, if you have no benefit from it right it was kind of along those lines that we presume there was those additive or even multiplicative actually effects of, of noise and odor annoyance in this case uh, in Windsor and we also saw potentially that you know this is this is these things are difficult to dig out and and, and surveys and, and relatively small populations like the city of Windsor actually is when it comes to these types of studies uh, that people changed their behaviors and were less likely to go, for example, for for walks to to exercise. And I mean, this makes logical sense. I think if you live in a really noisy area, it might be the tipping point. You know, in certain cases of people deciding to go out and go for a walk and getting that little bit of extra exercise. So there was a, a significant difference in both physical health as well as mental health between those two neighborhoods in Windsor. And noise was a predictive factor in that. I see that correlation of exercise or inhibiting potential ambition to exercise. Did you do any uh, physiological measurements of the population? At that time, no. So this was a population survey. People responded to a survey instrument that was distributed. And have you seen any more, more recent research that looks at any type of biomarkers? We're getting to the point now where technological and logistic challenges with doing big studies that include biomarkers are being conducted. In the early days, so 60s and 70s, actually, there, there was experimental studies, you know, understanding how our bodies respond to noise. And, you know, they, they knew back then that noise, as any other stressor or, or stimulus, can cause, you know, a physiological stress response acutely, right, in the short term. You can imagine how that would be done in a lab, you know, just uh, having someone sit there and, and anticipate noise or a sound event coming along and then basically scaring them with the sound and <laughs> measuring how that went. So that was kind of like a, a really early indicator of, of course, this is a stressor that can affect us. But the challenge then was to understand how does this translate into natural environments that we were not natural or built environments that we live in. And in response to not such jarring sounds, but perhaps a little bit more muted, but also much more repetitive over a long, over a long period of time. So that's where epidemiology and environmental studies that were able to start mapping noise levels on a large scale were put together as methodologies and, and brought us to current methods, which allow us to both you know, study really big populations in place, estimate exposures that they experience, and in some cases, complementing that with biometric data, uh, like, like blood pressure, EEG. Uh, and this is mostly, as far as I'm, I'm familiar with, at least during sleep. So there's been some really good studies showing that our physiology, our, our bodies do respond to noise while we're sleeping. And this is the scary bit of noise, I guess, is that we don't necessarily even wake up. There can be involuntary arousal of our nervous system during sleep that isn't strong enough to actually wake us up, but still uh, being registered because we shut our eyes, but we don't shut our ears, I guess. Is there a difference between noise? I mean, you know, we're talking urban settings versus natural settings. There are sleep apps, soundtracks, right, of, of the uh, crashing waves that help us go to sleep, but that is noise. So have you found anything on the differentiation between nature-made noise versus man-made? Yeah, no, this has come up a few times recently, and it's a really uh, interesting paradox, I guess you could say, that you know some, some of us purposely expose ourselves to different colors of noise, I guess, to help us sleep. But there's definitely the element that we kind of started off talking about where, you know, that there's a risk 
risk control and our perception of it that that comes into play you know when we're choosing to to listen to noise to help us sleep then immediately we're presumably not going to be annoyed by it because then we can just turn it off right that's obviously a, a perceptive conscious decision that matters and then during sleep in most cases i don't know maybe people crank up their uh, sleep apps to a really high decibel level, but I would assume in most cases, the types and characteristics of, for example, traffic noise that someone's being exposed to when they're trying to sleep is it's more random. It's probably going to be louder. It's got spikes. It's perhaps sometimes even accompanied by, you know, vibration if you're living really close to a roadway. So there's, we can call them both noise, but I wouldn't say they're really the same, same type of noise. Yeah. So the type of noise matters might be one way of looking at it. Yeah, it, it does. And and we know that uh, just even comparing different sources and, and the research that we do. So off the top, you know, I focus mostly on transportation sources, which anecdotally maybe throws people off because especially in a North American context, the car rules. And uh, I think it's taking a bit to get people to sort of look at traffic and roads in, in this perspective, because we're just so used to it. You know, it's a given part of life. So when I talk about noise, most people are like, oh yeah, concerts and dogs barking or construction. And and certainly those can be annoying, very annoying. And I, but I wouldn't necessarily think that your neighbor's dog barking is going to give you health problems. You know, it's, it's annoying probably. <laughs> So back to the, the sound being different, we know that if we quantify, uh, which we do quantify rail and air and road traffic in the same ways and the same metrics, then the same dose of aircraft noise, for example, will be more annoying than traffic noise. And that's because of there's more tonal elements to airplanes. They have a bit of a higher frequency. They're you know more intermittent, right? Like it comes and goes. So you get you know, it's like a death by a million paper cuts instead of like a one long, slow paper cut like the traffic would be, I guess. So, yeah, the tonality of, of sounds, the characteristics of them, the pitch, the frequency, all these things make a difference. But of course, in my area or colleagues that I work with, because we're looking at such a big scale, it's really challenging to characterize the sound down to that level of detail so we perhaps a bit unfortunately because we could learn more if we had the ability to to quantify and characterize noise more specifically we use basically just a weighted decibel scale as we call it which is arguably a scale that weighs the decibel levels according to our perception of loudness you've talked about briefly here airports is that akin to traffic or worse if we quantify them all the same way using this dba metric then at the same noise level, more people will be annoyed by air traffic noise than road traffic noise, and uh, railway noise is is less annoying than both of those. You know, I think you can imagine why, right? Like trains are perhaps more have a bit more of a, a lulling, soothing characteristic in, in their sounds than uh, both traffic and airplanes. No, I mean that's a very real debate among airports, meaning that there are clearly stakeholders who are very annoyed and and airports have had to change air patterns even and you know rapid ascents diminish noise do those things help yeah so i was actually just fortunate enough to not be a part of but got to learn a lot about a recent project out of the university of windsor actually that that looked at pearson airport and revisited how we quantify and and create the noise exposure contours that are basically used for everything around airports you know planning uh, zoning and, and uh, forecasting and all that so in general the area affected by airports has gotten smaller as you said because there are now more steeper ascents and, and descents and aircraft individually have become a lot quieter too, uh, which is great. Except in one case, interesting sidetrack, I guess people found that uh, although the engines were a lot quieter on this, I forget which aircraft it is, they actually complained a lot more about it because there was a certain airflow around the wings that made it sound like a screaming orca. <laughs> the manufacturer had to go back and, and do some changes in the design, I guess, to get that tone out of the airplane. But because of the volume of air traffic, those who are unfortunate to live in inside those shrinking noise contours are actually exposed to way more uh, noise. So it's it's a smaller area, but a higher impact. 
And has there been any long-term studies on the health impact in those sorts of geographic regions around airports? Yeah. Yeah. There's been uh, numerous good studies. There's been lots of studies that have done what we call cross-sectional measurements, where they just kind of one point in time, if you have data for the noise, you have data for the people, it might be, it might even be biometric data. But if you just do everything at one point in time, then you don't know what came first, you know, the the health effect or the noise exposure. So there's been fewer of those studies where they've had uh, the ability to usually do retroactive studies and go back in time, collect health data for people living in the vicinity of airport. uh, And this is how it's done for other sources too. Uh, And then see when does the health outcome of interest hit and uh, does it statistically matter that that they were exposed or is it different statistically by noise level? And yes, we do. We do see the same thing for air traffic as we do for for road and rail to a certain extent too, where we're where cardiovascular disease, ischemic heart disease is the most common and, and most strongly proven outcome. Hypertension or high, high blood pressure is, is a bit of a hit and miss, I guess. You know, some studies find it, others don't. You know, it's, it's really difficult to do these studies, again, on these large scales and have the data over a long period of time to, to and, and then to make it standardized and comparable across different areas too. So of course, it's good when studies report no effect. We, we need those too, but there's a bit more work to do for air traffic in particular, but that is, I suspect that's really just because up until this point, challenges in rare outcomes in small populations, right? Like ischemic heart disease isn't that rare in a population, but when you shrink it down to only around an airport and then filter out all the other reasons that lead to heart disease, you need a pretty big sample to to have that statistical effect size. But there are some that definitely show a, a signal. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. When I say it's a bit hit and miss, it's, it's really going along with a really high bar for, for quality that the WHO has, has set. And, and that's really based on the most comprehensive review to date was in 2018. So there's been really good and big studies after that, of course. But uh, at that time, there wasn't, uh, according to that framework, uh, that measure of quality and doing a meta-analysis, as, as we call it, wasn't really there for air traffic. And that's just because of the relatively few number of studies that were there, not because those studies individually weren't strong and didn't show effects, but the WHO is going to tell the world they, they want to be really certain that the data is there to support it. So it wasn't concluded that there's no health effects by any means. It was just, you know, we need, need a few more studies to corroborate these results and, and then uh, we will be certain but i guarantee you if you ask any of the authors <laughs> researchers that were part of those studies some of them are really high quality longitudinal studies and they did find health effects uh, you know they there's no question there are some people more affected than others uh, of course there's individual variability in uh, noise sensitivity and that's usually something we we ask about in, in surveys or, and then uh, collect information about whenever we have the chance. But that's, again, more on the perception side of things. It's not so clear that that really matters when it comes to health outcomes. So even someone who considers themselves themselves not to be noise sensitive or even have, you know, don't report high levels of annoyance can still be at risk for health outcomes. So I would talk more about vulnerability than I would talk about individual variability and susceptibility, I guess. So there's, you know, the the more pre-existing health problems you have, uh, the more at risk you're going to be from any stressor, right? And noise falls right in line with that. What does noise do to your ability to focus or concentration? Yeah, so most studies in this context have been done on students for good reason, right? <laughs> we want to know if, if that matters. And and uh, quite concerningly, yes, we've seen that students in schools with, with higher noise levels can lag behind in, in reading and uh, writing comprehension. So cognitive impairment would be the general terminology, I suppose. And, and uh, yeah, there's been research showing that that does happen. So I think we can all relate to it. You know, if we're trying to concentrate on something or listening to a teacher or a mundane professor, as I would be when I lecture, you know, don't don't have the most super energetic tone, I guess, uh, then if there's a noise trying to get your attention in the background, it's going to be harder and you're probably going to not do so well on that multiple choice test. Totally. It's very interesting. 
right? Because this is one of the topics you don't think about a lot. I mean, you it, it, you exist with it every day, right? It, it sort of occurs to you anecdotally, like I didn't hear that or was distracted by that, right? But the whole science behind it is extremely interesting. C- can people tune out noise mentally? I think people adapt. I, I would say that anyone who's able to live in those new towers that are basically hugging the Gardner Expressway have somehow managed to adapt to the noise levels. I've certainly heard stories of other people who moved into areas like that or or were proximity to noise sources like that and just uh, couldn't couldn't deal with it and had had to move. Right. So yeah, there's obviously a difference. Some people can tolerate and do tolerate it, and uh, that does affect the level of risk that this has in the population. But it, you know, it's still a significant health risk at a population level. And using that example, are there things you can do to mitigate the risk? Let's, let's say you, you, you moved into the, the condo or apartment near a freeway. Is there anything you can do? I don't really think this is in, an individual's responsibility. I don't think, you know, if this comes into, it becomes an environmental justice uh, and an equity issue too, right? Obviously, the more money you have, the more able you are to buy your way out of noise exposure. So I think the first thing that should be talked about isn't what can individuals do. I think it should be what more can we as society do. And that obviously comes down to government taking action on it due to, you know, enforce. It's not even about uh, changing it. We're just not even enforcing guidelines that are in place right now. You know, that would have led to a lot of buildings having triple pane glass and, and or even sound proofing windows and stronger insulation and facades and all these things that could reduce transmission of outdoor noise into into dwellings. Once you're in a place where that is happening and the building isn't doing the job for you, you know, like a lot of people in condos in Toronto can't be like, all right, I'm going to pick a different room in my house and sleep there because that's away from the traffic. You know, that's what we could say, but a lot of people don't have those options, obviously. So what are you left with? Stick some earplugs in and... Uh, <laughs> deal with it, right? Like there's a million things that can be done all the way from, you know, the source through transmission to the receptor, as we call humans. There's a lot of ability there, but I think a lot of individuals, their, you know, their hands are tied when it comes comes to that, you know, especially if it costs a lot of money. So I think reducing the source is tricky to do. That's, um, I had, had the opportunity to, over the last year, I was on a research sabbatical and worked for the government in Norway, actually, on setting new targets for for national noise exposure, and then and uh, along with that, creating those response relationships. So, getting a really precise understanding of the association between noise exposure and responses and different measurements like annoyance and sleep disturbance, because they interestingly do vary geographically. You know, th- their goal for the last twenty years, when they first set national noise goals, was that they could start reducing the source. Uh, and that, that was the best way to do it. But that's actually the mixed success with that. So the strategy really now is in, in planning and building design and how are new buildings constructed to make sure that they protect people as much as possible and that people have access to quiet areas. So, you know, in apartment buildings, a bit of a space luxury, I suppose, there, they have more room. So, the, you know, uh, I wouldn't say that in, in, in denser cities either, but most apartment buildings there would be built in such a way that the bedrooms are at the back of them, maybe living areas and where you occupy during the day or are more close to the, the source, but they're just built uh, in, a, in a way that helps reduce. And then again, the, the technical aspects of the building materials and, and even air vents and all these things matter a tiny little bit, right? Like make a very little difference how an event is oriented, but it can bring noise in and um, add it up to all the other things, you know, they, they start making a difference. So yeah, there's there's lots of opportunities. You know, I, I often get the question, you know, what can we do? And the first and best thing in Canada or Toronto would enforce speed limits and uh, enforce noise regulations that already exist on vehicles you know the government would actually make money off that (laughs) it doesn't even cost anything to do uh that would make uh the biggest impact with very little effort moving to evs must be a huge advantage uh, to mitigate this long term uh actually not (laughs) unfortunately talk to me (laughs) yeah up to about 30 40 kilometers an hour engine noise uh, on a normal vehicle might dominate, but once you get above that, uh, it's actually mostly tires that you're hearing anyway. And 
electric vehicles are often heavier. So they actually have often more tire noise than a combustion vehicle will have. So yeah, it's it's not uh, it's not a given that that's going to improve noise levels. Yeah, I mean, you know what's fascinating is I we just don't talk about it because you know what's great about your work is it is something you could clearly take into the thinking as respect to zoning and or building codes around freeways. So, so for example, we're not saying don't build an apartment building, but we're saying the building specifications need to be this if you're going to build on top of a freeway. Yeah, it sounds like it's been researched somewhat, but isn't common in part of certainly in North America. There's lots of research. There's a lot of data and information. I don't actually think we need much more research to to do. I personally think we should because that's what I do for a living. But, you know, we, we, we can and should start acting on on the information and data that we have. And there are actually good guidelines. There, there are relatively strong building codes that are suggested federally and, and enforced variably across the provinces. You know, in the last building code update i know there was some some pretty strict changes to transmission between units uh, or between dwellings and apartment buildings and you know there are rules or regulations you know but this is why we do have acoustic consulting companies out there and they do this day in and day out they go measure and then do assessments for uh, new developments but there's also quite a few loopholes that uh, at the end of the day, when it comes across a uh, municipality's development application desk, they can make that final call and and sort of ignore it and uh, allow things to proceed if they want to. So there's what's missing is really a firm law on noise levels in, in dwellings. And along with that, remove all the exceptions that, that might exist for it. Are there long-term studies? We talked about heart disease. Are there long-term studies on the mental effect we know it's annoying. It can affect sleep, but have we seen any other manifestations with respect to uh, depression, anxiety, etc.? Yeah, studies have shown associations with yeah exactly those outcomes. Lack of sleep, you know, that can uh, have a lot of bad effects on health, and uh, whether that's caused by noise or or something else. There's a really long list, and I haven't memorized the whole of it, but certainly, you know, we we need a good night's sleep for our brains to work like they should, and. Uh, you know, there, there's some some speculation, I suppose, that maybe maybe there's a correlation between you know, noise sensitivity and anxiety and, and depression, and there's something else maybe underlying it. I don't personally think that's a useful or doesn't really matter to a certain extent. You know, uh, we, we see the association. That's a concern. Yeah. Has there been anything over your years of researching this area that was a surprise to you? I think the biggest surprise... I've personally had in, in the research I've done is how loud our cities are, really, because we're we're a bit behind in Canada and in the US. We often lump ourselves together with them when it comes to research for some reason. But when it comes to characterizing noise at city scales, it's actually well, there's a national noise map in the US, but it's got pretty high uh, levels of error. Obviously, when you do a whole huge country like that, you got you got to take some shortcuts. So when I monitored and modeled the noise levels in, in Toronto for Toronto Public Health, which was in support of the bylaw review process uh, back in 2018, over 90% of people in Toronto uh, exceed sort of threshold guideline levels by the WHO for avoiding health impacts. I, can, I don't have the the list of percentages in front of me right now, but you know, there's a huge proportion of people uh, or a huge number of people that are exposed to excessive levels of noise. And and more recently, quantified this in the more standardized way of doing it in Europe now. So this is actually moving forward how most of, if not all, environmental health risks will be quantified because it allows for a comparison. So we call it uh, you know the burden burden of disease, and they're they're called visibility adjusted life years. So it, it's a metric or a number that allows us to combine the, the severity of a health outcome all the way from you know, zero having no impact up to one being death and summing those up across the population, right? And about 40,000 disability adjusted life years, is it's not by any means composed of 40,000 people dying prematurely. I think the estimate is around a couple of hundred per year uh, for Toronto, but nonetheless, 40,000 quality years of life in a city like Toronto are potentially lost every year because of just traffic noise exposure, not even the other sources. So back to the original question, we have some cities like Toronto and colleagues of mine have done this in a few other cities across Canada too, but we really don't have a good understanding of 
the extent of this problem nationally. Is there a way for our listeners to know if they're getting too much noise? I mean, there's lots of other actionable benchmarks in other areas of health. Is there is yeah. there one where they can go, oh my God, <laughs> this could be, my condo could be affecting my health. Yeah, so the, the threshold level that seems to you know, basically come out of every study uh, within a few decibels is 55 decibels averaged over a 24-hour period. 55 decibels is about the same level of noise at which you're starting to raise your voice a little bit when talking to someone. You, you kind of have to talk a little bit over the noise. It doesn't mean that you're yelling over it by any means, but that's sort of like the relatable nuisance level, I guess, of that noise level. And of course, you can imagine, you know, that's constant over the 24 hours. It can come in many different forms though, right? And most people, of course, will experience peaks of, of traffic noise during peak hours, and it'll be 70 decibels maybe for a few hours, and then it quiets down and, and you still averages out around that level. So that's maybe something to uh, test out for yourself at, at home. And of course, that's outside, right? That's the decibel level outside your window that's a recommended not to be above 55 decibels so if you're if you go outside and you have to raise your voice to have a conversation a little bit then you might be within <laughs> within the category that you would see uh increased health risks and again those health risks more likely of course for, for vulnerable populations populations and people with pre-existing health outcomes and uh, of course if you're i think people can tell if they're <laughs> in a noisy area for the most part but if you're you know waking up and don't feel fully rested and, and that goes on for a long time you know maybe uh, maybe it is having a bit of an effect on your sleep but again you don't necessarily have to wake up fully and have your eyes wide open to have been disrupted during your sleep by it so that's if you can't figure out any other reasons for not getting a good night's sleep maybe think about that noise source is there an app that does this on your phone that could detect this yeah, there's uh, a bunch of apps out there, some uh, better than others, and, and professionals actually use them too. So those, there's apps that you know you, you got to pay for. There's a bunch of free ones as well. The the somewhat tricky part about it now they'll they'll be reasonably precise within three to five decibels. So probably for get a rough idea of your noise exposure, they're totally fine. Of course, uh, when we get into the accuracy that we need for research, it's not what we want to see. But the one I'd recommend in general, and it's a bit of a discrimination against non-Apple users, I guess, the American Institute for Occupational Public Health, I don't know what the abbreviation is, but it's NIOSH, N-I-O-S-H. So that's an app that's actually calibrated. So the reason that this is more reliable is because all iPhones are, of course, built the same. And this app has been calibrated to work with iPhones. So the challenge with, with apps is that, of course, every different manufacturer will have a different type of microphone in it that might be more or less sensitive. So they need to be calibrated. So that's another way. You know, you can download any app and they will allow for calibration. But then you got to, of course, know where to play or, or get a, a sound and know exactly what decibel that sound is and then program that into that. But yes, there's lots of them. In most cases, they will give you a pretty good, pretty good idea of what's going on. That's super, uh, super helpful in actual information. Tor, thank you very much. I really appreciate you taking the time and thanks for all of your efforts and research in this area. It's definitely a topic. Like I said, that you know, we we deal with daily and can be annoying anecdotally, but but understanding its long-term impacts is super helpful. So thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Always happy to make noise about noise. <laughs> That was Sean Francis, Medcan Chair and CEO, in conversation with Dr. Tor Oriyama, Associate Professor of Geography and Environmental Studies at TMU and expert in urban noise and health. You can book a consultation with a Medcan expert by emailing bookingteam at medcan.com. Follow Medcan on Twitter and Instagram at MedcanLiveWell. We'll be posting episode highlights and other links you can visit on our website, eatmovethingpodcast.com. Say hello and send us a tip or a suggestion by emailing us at info at eatmovethingpodcast.com. Eat Move Think is produced by Ghost Bureau. I'm Jasmine Ratch, Managing Producer. Social media and strategy support is from Chantel Gertin, Andrew Imix, and Emily Bozik. And Christopher Shulgin is Executive Producer. We'll be back soon with another episode examining the latest in health and wellness.
This podcast episode is intended to provide general information about health and wellness only and is not designed or intended to constitute or be used as a substitute for medical advice, treatment, or diagnosis. You should always talk to your MedCan healthcare provider for individual medical advice, diagnosis, and treatment, including your specific health and wellness needs. This podcast is based on the information available at the time of preparation and is only accurate and current as of that date. Source information and recommendations are subject to change based on scientific evidence as it evolves over time. MedCan is not responsible for future changes or updates updates to the information and recommendations and assumes no obligation to update based on future developments. Reference to or mention of specific treatments or therapies does not constitute or imply a recommendation for endorsement. The links provided within the associated document are to assist the reader with any specific information highlighted. Any third-party links are not endorsed by MedCan.